On to the program for tonight. We have three remarkable North Face athletes on stage together, having a nice sort of fireside chat about what they did in their summer vacation. And tonight they're going to take us along with them to some of those wild and exotic places. Not your typical summer vacation. Jimmy Chin is one of them. Jimmy Chin has been on the North Face athlete team for over 10 years, bridging that critical gap between athlete and storyteller. Jimmy has worked with some of the very best climbers, snowboarders and skiers in the world and in extremely challenging conditions but he matches them, move for move and turn for turn, all the while shouldering a camera and documenting every move. His work has been profiled in all the major outdoor magazines and he has been honored many times for his photography and his filmmaking talent. Along with Jimmy, tonight we have Mark Sinnott, who is equally as comfortable on ice and mixed terrain as he is on rock. Now Mark has climbed high-end winter routes across the United States and Canada, France and Norway. And he's also a passionate skier. He recently made the first descent of a 5,100-foot couloir on Baffin Island. Mark works with the North Face research, design and development teams, and he's a freelance photojournalist, as well as a senior contributing editor at Climbing Magazine. He's a pretty busy boy, and this week he's been working hard as well all week watching films with our international jury. And finally, joining Jimmy and Mark, all the way from the UK, is Hazel Finley. Now, Hazel started climbing with her father at the tender age of seven. And when she's not studying philosophy at the University of Bristol, she is out there. She's climbing bold routes, she's climbing exciting routes, and ferociously difficult trad rock climbs in the UK, in the US, and in Australia. We all know Hazel from her starring role in the film Spice Girl. So please, everyone, give a warm BAMF welcome to Jimmy, Mark, and Hazel. Well, thank you, Bernadette. Uh, on behalf of the three of us, I just wanted to thank everybody that brought us here, uh, National Geographic Expeditions Council, uh, the North Face, and of course, Banff Mountain Film, uh, and thank you for putting on such an amazing film festival. So tonight, we were going to talk uh, about Oman, which is a trip we did uh, last year, and share some of the stories about how the three of us and a few others ended up in the Persian Gulf on a boat. And uh, I first read about Mark Sinnott uh, probably 20 years ago. And, you know, I thought over the years I've really appreciated the fact that he's really explored kind of every corner of the earth. And, you know, doing what I do, I'm always looking at different places. And you always think you found some place that nobody's ever been. And then you find out that Mark's been there. And, um, <laughs> you know, I consider him probably one of the most prolific exploratory rock climbers of my generation. And uh, beyond, you know, pushing the edge for a lot of years, like the northwest face of the Great Trango and any number of other trips that I can think of, uh, Mark is an incredible uh, writer and storyteller, which is great for me because I'm a photographer and he's a writer, so that works really well. Um, Mark is probably going to tell a few stories tonight, and he's such a good storyteller that, especially the stories about me, you probably want to divide what he says in half. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so Mark and I have been on um, quite a few wild trips over the years, and I think, looking back, uh, probably the most life-threatening situations I've ever been in that were non-climbing related have been with Mark. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, <laughs> I think. I guess the reason why I'm here is because I just love going on adventures. And um, I have 
tried to find a way to um, turn my whole life, you know, into one big adventure. And, um, you know, as such, it's really important for me to be able to, like, tell the stories about the adventures so that I don't have to come home and have a real job. <laughs> and that's where this relationship with Jimmy works so well, because I'm not good with cameras, and um, I really don't want to take a photo. I, I started out, um, you know, wanting to do a bunch of photography, and now at this point, I basically take photos with my phone, and that's about it. As you guys know, being here at Banff, the, the, uh, the images and the stories are, are a really important part of this. Otherwise, you know, um, you know, there's nothing to share with you and with each other. And so um, Jimmy has been, you know, uh, an awesome partner for me because we can work together. And I do oftentimes come up with the ideas, but Jimmy's the one who's actually doing all the really hard work of um, documenting what's going on and doing an amazing job with it. Uh, part of what makes Jimmy, you know, such a great partner is how modest he is. And if you just met this guy on the street, you wouldn't really know, um, you know, what an amazing athlete he is. And um, he's done all kinds of crazy stuff, you know. Um, in the climbing and the ski world, and I'm going to tell some stories about some of that over the course of, of this evening. Um, but those skills that enable him to do his photography in a way that most people wouldn't be able to. And um, he's really easy to work with and just fun to hang out with. So um, we were just backstage, and uh, we were scheming for our next adventures. <laughs> And uh, hopefully we will be back with some more stories to, uh, to share with you guys. So he and I have been, uh, do, been doing it for a pretty long time. Um, and we're both part of this North Face climbing team. And, you know, as you get older on this team, you, um, you kind of become what they call a silverback. <laughs> and if you're a good silverback, you get to stay on the team. <laughs> Um, part of that is that you um, may get the opportunity to mentor one of the younger climbers who are coming up through the ranks. And, um, you know, I use that term mentor pretty loosely. And I think some of the younger climbers, like Honold and perhaps Hazel, don't appreciate it too much once they actually get out there with me. And then ha having to literally haul me up the cliff. <laughs> but <laughs> Jimmy and I, we, we create opportunities to get them out into crazy places in the world. And, um, you know, there's one thing that, like, some of these youth don't really understand is that <laughs> I, am, I am actually using them, you know, um, you know, for my own personal goals, which are to get up these climbs, which I'm not good enough to ascend anymore. And um, just remember that, um, you know, whatever, whatever Hazel might have to say. <laughs> but yes, um, Hazel came onto the North Face team, and there's a suggestion made by someone, you know, at the company that maybe she should come with us on one of our trips. We had a trip in the works to Newfoundland, and um, someone said, you got to bring this new, this new girl along with you. I didn't really know much about Hazel, but I did know that she, you know, was an amazingly talented rock climber and potentially, like, you know, one of the best female rock climbers in the world. Um, obviously, that made me a little nervous. More than anything, I was just wondering what she would be like and would I enjoy hanging out with her. And um, as I think you'll see over, over the course of this evening, we ended up um, becoming pretty good friends. And hopefully we have a lot of adventures ahead of us still. Okay. Which one I press for you? Yeah. Um, so yeah, like Mark said, um, we first met in uh, Newfoundland. It, it was pretty funny because, you know, I'd heard 
a lot about Mark, but it, it's one thing hearing what someone's done on paper, you know, they, they've climbed this, they've climbed that, but until you actually meet them, you can't really put together their character. But yeah, when we got there, um, it actually rained for nearly the entire trip. Um, Mark gets annoyed when I say it rained for the, for the whole time, because we did actually climb one thing, but um, it meant spending a lot of time in the tent talking, because there was nothing else to do. And um, it was great having Mark along, because he has so many stories to tell. And um, he, he definitely tells them in quite an entertaining way. Um, I think the funniest thing he said was, guys, when we run out of whiskey, the trip is over. <laughs> and he said it in such a way that I, I, really, I really knew it was true. Um, <laughs> But um, a lot of his stories involved Jimmy, and, um, and it, it would always involve Jimmy somehow managing to get them out of a sticky situation, mostly using charm um, and good looks. Yeah, we were just backstage, and Jimmy made the mistake of revealing to me for the first time ever what his name actually means in Chinese which is, I think, what, Golden Touch or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> it really... See what I'm talking about? <laughs> it Cut really it makes half. sense, um, but it, maybe it means gold. So, 2009, I came up with this, this idea to go to a place called Lowe's Gully, which is in Borneo, and it's on the back side of Mount Kinabalu, and it, it, this is what you're looking at right here is a picture down into the, uh, into the gully. And it's the world's deepest slot canyon. And so, as I said, really the reason why I do this stuff is just to try to go on as many crazy adventures as possible. So I'm always looking around and trying to see kind of like what new ideas there might be. And um, I came up with this idea that we would rappel down into the bottom of this really, really deep slot canyon and then climb back out on a cliff um, on the side of the gully, which is totally absurd, um, but some people liked the idea. North Face liked it. And I, I pitched the trip, and this thing kind of took off. Um, the problem was is that I never sort of did my due diligence as far as checking in whether you were actually allowed to go into Lowe's Gully. And it turned out that you're not. <laughs> and by that point, the trip had taken on a life of its own, and I had like this magazine assignment going. I had sponsors that were all fired up about this. I had a bunch of money. So I was like, I'm just gonna go over there and I'm gonna try to make it work. So we got there and it was this situation where I had to like pay all the money up front before I found out whether we could actually do it or not. <laughs> so then I ended up in this like bureaucrat's office talking about this permit that I needed really, really badly. And the conversation was kind of going like, the guy had his arms crossed, he was shaking his head, he was frowning. He was looking at me like in a mean way and telling me how it was absolutely impossible and no one is allowed to go into the gully at all. And I could kind of see like my whole career <laughs> crumbling before me. And that's when I spotted Jimmy in the doorway. Like just somehow he sensed that things were going badly. <laughs> and he, I got the tap on the shoulder like, tapping me out of the ring, like, I got this. <laughs> and Jimmy walked up, and again, he's going to deny this, but this is what happened. <laughs> he basically put his arm around this guy, and he pulled out his iPhone, and he was like, have I showed you the pictures of me skiing Everest? <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> there it is. That's the shot. And I will never forget, like, the transformation that came over this man as he switched from dealing with me to Jimmy Chin. And I walked out of there, and, um, and the rest was history, basically. Within a couple minutes, Jimmy had the permit in hand. And uh, 
we were on our way to the gully. Probably the most significant thing about this trip for us was that it was our first trip with Alex Honnold. And uh, so this was 2009. I think Alex's like breakthrough season in Yosemite was 2008, maybe. He had come onto the North Face team, and it was the same situation. Hey, you, you guys should bring this guy along with you on this trip. And so, of course, I thought to myself, you know, that seems like a really, really bad idea for me to climb with Honnold. Uh, this guy's the world's greatest free soloist, and I basically like to climb with a rope. <laughs> and um, I, I am a father of, of three, and I have a very healthy preoccupation with my well-being. But we wanted to give Alex this opportunity to go on his first international expedition. So we brought him along. And, um, and again, this was like having a secret weapon. It was like having Hazel along. And I think um, I've got a little video here that kind of quickly sums up what it was like to, uh, to climb with someone like Alex. Sort of just to free climb as much as I can. So that means that I come just behind everybody. As long as I'm actually climbing, that's more important to me than, than pushing our high point. No, I don't think I'd ever met Mark before this trip. Alex Honnold was somebody that I didn't know. It's a really interesting dynamic mentorship. Teach him, you know, how we go about doing like these, these types of, of pioneering first ascents. But I'm learning a lot of stuff from him too because he's such an amazingly talented climber over the years is like the longer that I've climbed kind of the more cautious I become every year I kind of reel it in a little more and a little more and a little more now I'm going out with this guy who's kind of like the opposite of that he's like letting the line out letting it out a little more a little more it's 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 been good in that it's it's helping me to realize that like I can't reel it in too much crazy location where you're a thousand feet off the ground in the middle of nowhere. Like you, you kind of have to go for it in this sport. Well, I mean, I knew there wouldn't be that much gear on. I worried that I might land on top of Mark if I fell. It was a little scary around lead. It was sick. Run, Mark. Preserving your safety and all that. <laughs> I try so hard. But at the same time, um, kind of preserving like that, that, that spirit of, of adventure and going for it, which is right at that essence. Yeah. Come on, over. Yeah, dude. You didn't even get pumped. I don't know. I numbed out there. Well, definitely part of the um, joy of being on these trips is watching Mark and Alex um, go back and forth. And, you know, it's kind of like a tradition now. I wait for the call every year from Mark. I have no idea where we're going. I always know that it's going to entail some sort of completely outrageous location. This uh, next trip that we did with Alex was uh, to the Ineti Desert. And of course, he always brings up a place that I've never heard of. Uh, but this place was spectacular. It was uh, not, let's see, four days of off road driving from Anjamina in Chad. And Nobody had ever climbed here, and it's kind of like a climber's paradise because there's just endless uh, sandstone towers, like thousands of them, and none of them in, had been climbed. Um, I don't know how you found this. How, how did you find this spot? Um, how did I find the Veneti Desert? I heard about it when I was in Cameroon in 1999, and someone had said that... Uh, you should look into the climbing um, possibilities in, in Chad. And so what I did was I, I got onto Google Earth. And um, there's a mountain range in the northern part of Chad called the Tabesti Mountains. So I, I checked that out, but it was kind of a known place. And I had the feeling there was something else there that people didn't know about. And as I panned around, it's basically like the edge of the Sahara Desert, I, I saw all this topography um, down to the south of the Tabesti Mountains. 
And um, if any of you guys have played around with Google Earth, um, you know like how robust it is as far as exploring the world. And you can toggle through all the different um, sort of um, you know, features, and I put the place names up, and a couple little village names popped up, and then I started Googling those, and I, I found some images. I didn't find this one here of, uh, of the wine bottle, but I found another image of the Arch of Bashikale. And uh, that was basically like when Google Earth first started up. And, um, and that's really how I have found a lot of the, uh, the places, you know, that I, that I wanna go and explore. Uh, the the Aneti Desert is like the Canyonlands Desert of Utah, um, but it's much bigger. It's 60,000 square kilometers. And if I'm not mistaken, that's like about the size of West Virginia. And so picture a place like West Virginia covered with sandstone towers that have never been climbed before. And I know there's a lot of climbers out here, so as far as I have heard, no one has been back to the Aneti since we were there in 2010. When we pulled in, um, the argument that was happening when we first drove into the first canyon was whether there were thousands of unclimbed towers or tens of thousands of unclimbed towers. Um, part of the reason why we're talking about the Anetti is because Jimmy really wants me to tell this story. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, being here at Banff and being on the jury and watching 84 films which I just finished up earlier today, um, has been pretty enlightening and it has made me think a lot about why I do this stuff and why everybody else does it. And I think a lot of the filmmakers have been like trying to figure that one out too. And um, it's obviously about the mountains, but really for me, I think it boils down more to the people. And it's the people that I go with, like Jimmy and Hazel, but it's also the people that I meet um, in these places, in every crazy place that I've been in the world, there have been people who live there, including in the Aneti Desert. Um, but there are a few bad apples out there, you could say. Um, we were checking out this, this tower that we wanted to climb, and all of a sudden, these guys came out of nowhere. And they came walking up to us, and. I remember thinking how weird it was that all of a sudden there were all these guys walking up to us and they were walking really quickly and also that it was strange the way they were all holding their hands on the pommels of these daggers that they were wearing in their belts. And I, I'm kind of naive, I guess, but I thought that's weird the way they all like have their hand on their daggers when they're walking up. <laughs> and it, it turned out that, uh, that they were we, we, we call them bandits. They were basically they were they were there to rob us. Um, so this is one of those situations where you get kind of like the uh, the fight or flight instinct, and for me that was flight. <laughs> and I they were kind of surrounding us, and I was eyeing the gaps between the bandits, like where do I have my best chance that I can run away and hopefully be faster than these other guys. Um, Faster than me. <laughs> yeah. Jimmy had a different reaction. <laughs> Jimmy thought, no, we need to fight. And so what he did was he reached down and he grabbed the biggest rock that he could find and he lifted it up over his head like Cro-Magnon Man. <laughs> <laughs> oh At this God. point, a lot of the other people had retreated, but I was standing right next to Jimmy. And so <laughs> I said to myself, okay, Mark, here's how it's going to go. I'm gonna look down at the ground. If I see anything that looks like a good weapon, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fight with Jimmy. If I don't see anything, I'm gonna run. <laughs> so I looked down, I, didn't know. <laughs> I looked down and no joke, there was like a gnarled club leaning against my foot. <laughs> like the only <laughs> piece of wood in the entire Netty Desert. But... It was literally a club. And so I was like, okay, well, that's it then. So I picked up the club, and, um, and Jimmy and I, you know, we, uh, we were there, you know, kind of staring these guys down. And um, thankfully, they decided that it wasn't worth it. 
And um, I guess they realized at that point, you know, we were going to get stabbed and they were going to get clubbed and bashed with rock. <laughs> and there weren't any hospitals anywhere around. So <laughs> this isn't worth it. Uh, so let's get out of here. And um, they retreated. One other part of the story is that the first thing they did was they grabbed this camera, camera bag. And um, it had a lot of equipment in it. And it was Renan Ozturk's bag. And... Um, this, this photo that you're looking at here was a frame grab of the video that Renan shot while the guy was robbing him at knife point. <laughs> and one thing that I learned from this experience is that <laughs> when you're getting robbed, you don't want to be filming because <laughs> they don't like that. <laughs> so now we're going to talk about Oman a little bit. And what you're looking at here is uh, a map of the place that we went. And this is called the Musandam Peninsula. And this image here is what I saw on Google Earth. And this is really what inspired the trip because I had never seen topography like this before. Uh, this is the tip of the Arabian Peninsula. And so that's the southern shore of the Strait of Hormuz. So on one side, to the west, you have the Persian Gulf, and to the right, you have the Gulf of Oman. And right on the tip of the peninsula is uh, this crazy fjord land that they call uh, Norway of the Persian Gulf. And um, if you look there, you can see a tiny little isthmus that uh, connects the whole thing. And at its narrowest part, that thing is 200 yards across. Um, but the elevation of the highest point out on that crazy piece of land that looks like a dragon is 3,000 feet above sea level. Um, and it's all limestone cliffs. And basically, it's a, um, a, a range of limestone mountains that are getting pushed underneath the sea by uh, the collision of, of two tectonic plates. And so you've just got the tips of the, of the mountains that are sticking up above. And uh, this trip really worked for me because as soon as I started looking into it, I realized the only way to fully do this place justice was to explore it by boat. Over the last decade or so, I've become kind of obsessed with the idea of being a mariner. That actually started with the trip that Jimmy and I did to, to Pitcairn Island in 2005. And uh, that that's like an hour and a half long story <laughs> that I could tell you guys <laughs> another time, but uh, I'm, I'm currently um, very um, passionate about exploring the world like by boat. The idea of combining uh, sailing and climbing was really, really appealing to me. So what we did was we, um, we chartered a 44-foot uh, a catamaran, and um, we used this thing as our floating base camp to go out and explore the climbing potential of the Musandam. One thing, again, just for the climbers out there in the audience to know, is that a pretty careful estimate has the amount of um, cliff line at between 100 and 150 kilometers of cliff. And we did maybe like 20 routes. So there's lifetimes worth of, of climbing out there, as Hazel will tell you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what it was like to travel around on a boat with seven guys, <laughs> me being the only girl. I'm um, pretty used to being on climbing trips with only men, but when you've just got a tiny little catamaran to be in, you can't just like run off and have a minute to yourself. Um, but uh, it was pretty good being a girl in some respects because I got my own little cabin, whereas Alex had to sleep on the roof of the boat, as you can see in the picture, <laughs> which um, suited me fine. We had this amazing freedom because we just sail around in and out of these little fjords, or big fjords, and um, we could say, you know, oh, we like the look of that cliff, and we just drop the anchor and sail to shore on a little rubber dinghy and go and climb stuff. So it was awesome because, you know, we weren't restricted by roads or pathways or anything like that. We could just literally just sail right up to the cliff. Um, so originally the whole trip was um, supposed to be about deep water soloing, that we would just sort of climb these 
cliffs up out of the water. But when we realized the scale of the geography, we ended up being more excited by climbing all these cool ridges. So one of the cool things for sure is that we would go down these fjords, and then at the back of these fjords would be these little villages um, really far out there. But behind one of the villages was this, it was a pretty huge wall. It was probably a 3,000 foot climb. And uh, of course, you know, part of my job, we, we were on assignment and we were shooting it for uh, National Geographic. And um, we decided we were going to go up on this wall. And uh, so we split up into three teams. And Hazel and Alex were one team. And Mark and Renan were on another team. And then I was climbing with uh, Mikey Schaefer, uh, who was my assistant and super rad climber himself. Um, and uh, we headed up this, this route. And you know, for me, the goal, you know, I'm always trying to figure out, actually, it's a team effort. You know, we're always trying to figure out, OK, how can we do all this stuff and then document it as well? And so Mikey and I were going to climb as a separate team and shoot the other two teams. Uh, of course, Hazel and Alex blasted off, and we didn't see them after 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, fortunately, Mark and Renan were climbing more our speed. Um, and uh, we were climbing up this route. Mark and Renan were off to the left. And we were probably about 1,000 feet up this climb. And Mikey was leading a uh, pitch. And he pulled this flake off. It was probably a you know, large piece of size rock. And it came sailing down at me. and. You know, I did the typical thing. I was like, oh, which way is it going to go? And I ducked, and it kind of exploded about 50 feet above my head. And everything was OK. Mikey was like, hey, are you all right? I'm, I was like, I'm fine. So Mikey leads off around the corner uh, for probably like half an hour. And you know, the rope wasn't moving. And I just figured he was building a belay um, so that he could belay me up. And about. Half an hour later, uh, I hear Mikey say, hey, I'm off belay. And I yell, yeah, you're off, you know, you're off belay. I take him off belay. And then about five minutes later, I hear this blood-curdling scream. Just, Mikey doesn't scream a lot, so I knew something was wrong. Um, and he just yelled, pull on your rope. Um, and I pulled on my rope. And it just slithered down to my feet. And Mikey had been up top, you know, built his belay and pulled the rope up, you know, to the end, except for I wasn't attached to the end. It had been cut completely in half. So we were up on this cliff with about 2,000 feet of climbing left. And um, that's kind of like my, this is the end. No. Um, so. <laughs> I'm a photographer, so I took a picture of myself with the cut rope. Um, you know, I guess that's kind of some of the hazards of the job. But I'd actually, I've never had a rope get cut completely in half. And we're stranded in the middle of this face. Uh, but fortunately, Mark came and. I rescued Jimmy Chen. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Matt. Anytime. Yeah. This is why I'm skeptical whenever they say that I have to get on stage with Mark, but it's okay. But in this case, it did actually happen. That <laughs> Mark saved me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I was glad that didn't happen to me. And uh, yeah. me and Alex were back on the boat by midday snorkeling, and we were like, whoa, these guys are taking a long time. Eventually. <laughs> They came back, and we could tell something had happened. They all started pouring gin and tonics. <laughs> but yeah, uh, even though, like I said, we, we got pretty psyched on the, the biggest stuff, after such a stressful day like that, we were also psyched to deep water solo. It's like less committing. It's kind of interesting being a girl doing this kind of stuff in a uh, Muslim country. When I was packing my bags, I was like, wow, you know, all the local women are going to be wearing burqas. I wonder if I can go deep water soloing in a burqa. Luckily, 
the, the local people there were so relaxed and so chilled and the, the local guys who were, were sailing the boat were, were, were really relaxed. So, but yeah, you know, Jimmy talked about some of the hazards of the bigger stuff we did, but the deep water soloing there was actually kind of exciting as well. Because the cliffs were so big, at some point you just have to like drop off and be like, yeah, okay, we're good. We, we don't want to go any higher. But it was also um, kind of chossy. Um, here I'm actually just playing around and I pull that into like a perfect pencil dive, honestly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but like, if you do fall on your face or fall on your ribs or something deep or soloing, it can be quite nasty. Renan pulled a rock off onto his head. Alex is just checking him. We obviously didn't have anyone remotely like a doctor on board, so he, he got Alex. <laughs> Honestly, I think this is like the most compelling thing about these trips for me, more so than the climbing, is the the people that we meet when we go to these places and um, the locals in uh, in Musandam are called the Kumzaris. They're they're very interesting people that have a history that isn't really very well understood. And I think this is part of the reason why we got the assignment with National Geographic is because there was a, a very interesting um, culture that lived in the place that we were gonna go on our adventure. So the Kumzaris are about 5,000 people and they live out in these villages out on the Musandam Peninsula that you can only get to by boat. One of the most interesting things about them is that they have their own language. And uh, the language um, is based on um, Persian and Arabic. Let's see if I can remember this and get it right. And then it has um, elements and words from uh, Hindi, Spanish, Italian, French, and English. And so writing this story that I, that I put together for National Geographic, you do some pretty serious fact checking, you know. I was like in touch with a linguist that got their PhD in studying this language. And the bottom line is they have no idea <laughs> where it came from. And um, one of the theories, you know, about the Kumzaris is that they, they got pushed by like Arab invaders. Um, they lived on the main line and they got mainland and they got pushed out into these remote villages like as a, as a way to like kind of hide out, you know, and get away from like slave traders and stuff like that. Another theory, and I'm not sure at this point if maybe I made this theory up, but um, it's a theory is that the Kumzaris are the descendants of shipwrecked sailors. Um, and that that's how they have all these different words in their language. And the thing that was kind of funny about it is when we went through the fact-checking process, they were like digging into my theory, which I had wrote about. They were like, yeah, we're not really finding any, anything on this theory. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> I was like, it's a theory, you know, like, <laughs> I don't think you need, you don't need full justification for that. Um, but you guys can think about it for yourself. Like, how does this language have English words in it? So we went, we went to these villages. And when we got to the villages, what I wanted to do was to meet the people. Uh, so we went to this village called Sibi. And there's all these guys there. And they're pretty interested to see us. There's not a lot of like, guys like us that are showing up in these places. They, these guys all have the same last name. It's like basically one family that lives in this, in this village. And so we have, our, we have an Omani with us on our, on our crew who's our translator. And he is translating for me while I'm like interviewing these guys and learning about like how they live, which is fishing. And um, they have a history with boat building and they grow figs and they raise goats in their little village. And um, Alex is there and he's got his pack. And, um, and he's getting all fidgety. He, he's respectful enough to ask me, like, hey, do you mind if I take off and explore the village? You know, which is code for, I'm going to go climb something rad. 
And I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. So he takes off. I'm talking to the guys. And um, it's like 20 minutes later, one of the guys points up at the cliff and they all just start freaking out. They're all just yelling and pointing up at the wall. And, you know, I have a pretty good idea of what's probably going on. <laughs> this is my crummy photo, by the way, if you wonder why this one isn't good. Oh, sorry. This is after I doctored it up on Photoshop. <laughs> That's Alex <laughs> up on the wall. So I asked Abdullah, like, what's going on? You know, what are they saying? And he said, you know, Mark, it's really hard for me to translate, but basically they think Alex is a witch. That one's true. True. That, that is actually true. True yeah, story. That is true. True story. Yeah. The fact that we verified that one story might speak for the rest of the story. <laughs> told, but we, we did quite a lot of deep water soloing and, and bigger stuff. And then we also did quite a lot of roped climbing out of the water. Because obviously, when you get to a certain height, you, uh, you can't just like fall in. And this climb was, was really classic because it speaks to how good Jimmy is at taking photos. Because the rock was actually utter shit on this route. And it was really funny because we were beeling out of the little rubber dinghy. And you know, usually how you like duck under the cliff to like stop rocks falling on you or whatever. But because we were in this dinghy just sort of like drifting around, we kept drifting into the line of fire and um, like furiously paddling to try and get out of the way again. But yeah, so, so we enjoyed a lot of the rope climbing as well as the, the DWS. <laughs> I think it's funny that Hazel talks about that because what really happened <laughs> was that we'd scope out these objectives. Like, for example, this thing here in the back. Oh, there. sorry. I'm looking at a screen right here. It's right here. Uh, it's a 2,000-foot it's a cliff. No, it's bigger. It's, it's a big cliff. And here's me on the boat, racking up. And Hazel's like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm racking up. I'm getting ready for the climb. And her and Alex come over, and they're just shaking their heads. They're like, no, we're not bringing all that stuff. They're like, this is a hike. <laughs> <laughs> That's really what they said. And I'm looking up at the cliff. I'm like, I don't, I've been climbing for a while. I'm like, that doesn't look like a hike. <laughs> I'm like, that looks like a cliff. <laughs> and um, I, I went to Jimmy, and I was like, Jimmy, like, you know, you got to back your bro up here. Like, we need some gear. <laughs> like, you need it for the photos, right? And he's like, I gave him a wink. He's like, oh, I get it. Yeah, yeah, we need, we need the rope for the photo. <laughs> so we get to the... Uh, uh, we get to the base of the cliff, and Hazel's like, oh, hey, I'll carry the rack. And, and Alex is like, oh, I got the rope. And I'm like, okay, cool. Well, I guess I don't have to carry anything. You know, that's nice. I'll be nice and light. Um, and then they just, they take off. <laughs> and um, <laughs> even Alex will admit that this, this, this is exactly what actually happened, is as he was... <laughs> soloing away from me with all the gear. I yelled up and I was like, hey, like, what's going to happen here? You know, like, what if, what if we need the rope? And he yelled down, don't worry, I'll stop when I think it's appropriate for us to rope up. <laughs> <laughs> and as you can imagine, that time never happened. <laughs> That one was true, too. Yeah, <laughs> that actually happened. But um, <laughs> that kind of sums up that trip. You know, these trips are always a lot of humor and hilarious because, yeah, Mark likes to tell good stories. So uh, we were just going to end the show with a little video uh, showing what we were up to out there.
started thinking about where I hadn't been before. And I realized that the Middle East was a pretty big kind of blank on the map for me personally. I found a reference and it said something to the effect of the fascinating and mysterious Musandam Peninsula and that was about all it said. Some of the most interesting stuff I've ever seen in the world, which is like big sort of jagged limestone peaks that just fall straight into the water. For rock and water and that's it. right now. Soloing is defined by climbing without a rope. And so deep water soloing is soloing rock climbs above deep water. So this is the first time that I've ever deep water soloed. Yeah, I had the notion in my head that it was like kind of easy and low commitment. But I found out on this trip that it's a lot more serious than I thought. The water turns into rock when you go high enough. You will really hurt yourself. And hopefully there's no sharks. <laughs> Um, we have time for a very few questions from the audience. If you have something to ask, if you want to volunteer your services for the next trip that they have planned, <laughs> stand up, wave wildly, and uh, someone will approach you with a microphone. Uh, Bernadette, I have a question for Jimmy. Yeah. You're a world-class climber and a world-class photographer. Which is the greater challenge for you? To lead a difficult pitch or to create an award-winning image? Um, well, I think that might be overstating a few things, but... Uh, <laughs> um, I think probably... Well, I mean, I think the challenge for me is always trying to uh, um, create an image when I'm under some sort of physical or mental distress. It's not always like that. This trip was more logistically 
challenging trying to figure out, you know, because you show up into a place where you've never been um, and you're trying to find angles to shoot. Uh, but I think when it's bigger mountains or high altitude or cold, uh, it's, you know, you're always still a climber first and then, and then you're a photographer. So they're, they're both hard at some point. One's, you know, more challenging depending on where I am and what I'm doing. Yeah. A mic over there, please. With the language, did they have any authentic, really great pirate swear words? <laughs> <laughs> they probably did, most certainly, although they didn't share them with us. Um, but we had lots of good cursing going on on our boat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, up on the right. So uh, I was just wondering, this goes out to all three of you, um, taking out uh, permits, funding, access, whatever it may be, what would be sort of your number one on your bucket list for an adventure? Taking out every restriction, if you can do it, where would you guys want to go? That's a tough one. Yeah, that's tough. We probably wouldn't be willing to reveal that right here <laughs> in, front, in front of like a thousand hardcore outdoor enthusiasts. But uh, <laughs> we were secretly going over some plans. And Hazel, how about you? Uh, I can't think of one place in particular, but I think sort of like... I'm quite interested in doing long road trips that, you know, you said, like, take out the permits and the restrictions and that kind of thing. Like, I've always wanted to travel through uh, Europe down into Africa. Um, I know some of, it, some of the areas are quite dangerous and, like, crossing borders is tricky. So, I mean, that, that would be a dream thing to do is, like, you know, travel by road on these, like, big adventures, like, south from England, but then also east as well. So that's something that interests me. Right on. Very cool. I, I do um, have kind of a secret plan to set off on my boat, which is on the coast of Maine, and um, load up like all my climbing and ski gear. And instead of going on like a multi-week mission, go on like a multi-year adventure around the world. <laughs> Uh, I didn't sign up for that one. <laughs> My wife probably wouldn't yeah, be too I, happy about it. I need to take it slow because I've got three young kids, but yeah. <laughs> someday. Right. Are there any more questions out there? Or, Thanks, guys. Yep, we have someone right over there. Hazel, I have a question for you. You mentioned something about clothing, and I'm just wondering, um, and I'd like you to expand on that just a bit more. How did you ha reconcile your freedom and what you needed to wear in order to climb and your respect for a culture that y you were in that I assume didn't have that same amount of freedom in their women's attire. <laughs> oh, well put. Um, well, I, I just started off at the, at the beginning of the trip being quite modest um, and just sort of seeing what the reactions were and... Um, you know, when we were on the boat, there was the... Was, was it two or three Omani guys? Two Omani two, guys. Two Omani guys, Abdullah and... Faisal. Faisal, yeah. And so I was a bit worried about those guys because, you know, their, their wives, their daughters aren't going to be going out climbing up rocks in bikinis. Um, and so I was worried about what their reaction would be. But I soon realized that, you know, they're smart guys. They, they ran a a charter company um, taking tourists out on a catamaran. Um, of course, Western women are going to wear different things to their wives and their daughters, and, and they just understood that, and they were smart about it, and they were relaxed, and they were friendly. And so after a while, I realized that, and I, just, I started to act you know, how I would normally. Um, so I think that's the best thing to do. You just have to judge the situation for yourself and see what's appropriate and what's not. And there was no one there except for Abdullah. And yeah, then, yeah that, and they were the only guys, yeah. All right. Thank you, Hazel. I think that's all the time we have for some questions, so let's say thank you one more time to these guys. 